okay i think um it's just gone 11 so we should um, probably get going uh this week's social guest is uh Pruksa yang tong tong who's the co-manager of asia dragon and um, should be quite an interesting chat um but first i've got a bit of news to run through for you more topics than normal but i, I won't spend any longer on it um I want to talk about batteries first, and then briefly Tritex Big Box Suite, uh, Kibeni Value Plus, and uh, Linzel Train, and then what's going on with European opportunities. Um, so let's start with uh, the battery um, market. Um, we've got two dedicated funds in the sector looking at batteries. So uh, Gore Street Energy Storage and Gresham House Energy um, Storage. Um, the Gore Street one has just launched another fundraise this morning. Um, it's the smaller of the two, as I'll show you in a second. Um, but it, they're not the only funds that are actually looking at this area. Um, Jelly and Environmental, which uh, you know we, we write on already, um, it's been looking at, it's got one battery project in its portfolio and it's been looking at seeing whether it makes sense to add more. Um, and Bluefield Solar has just announced this morning that it wants to expand its mandate to include a wider range of renewable energy, um, and that will include some wind probably, um, but also um, battery storage as well. So I suppose the question is why? Why, why is it really piling into this stuff? Um, you can see the um, basic stats from quoted data here on these um, renewable energy funds. Um, the Gore Street Fund is an awful lot smaller than Gresham House, so 47 million market cap against 250. And it launched first, which is a bit, you know, it's, it's a bit unfortunate it's, it hasn't grown as fast. Um, and when you look at the um, performance stats, it actually had a much better year. Uh, so 9% return last year against um, six for three for Gresham House. Um, I, but a part of that is really the uh, depreciation of Sterling because a lot of Gore Street's projects are actually in Ireland. Um, and so the um, weaker pound is actually flattering the value of those. So they're probably sort of running in tandem. Gore Street's got a, a new backer this morning. Um, it's done a couple of deals with um, big investors. So the, the big one they did before was with the Irish government body, uh, National Treasury Management Agency. Um, and this morning it's um, JXTG Nippon Oil and Energy which is going to put three million quid in um, and they're raising money alongside that. So I, I do think these things are interesting. Uh, I was trying to explain why. Um, the, re the main reason why we need batteries um, on the grid network is because of the shift towards renewable energy, which is an important shift and something that we, we should definitely need to be doing. But um, the way that the a cloud comes along and then sort of power, power dips or the wind stops blowing and the wind power dips that makes it more unpredictable um, and because you can get these fairly instant fluctuations in generation that affects the frequency across the whole network at the moment it's we're really much more talking about wind than we are about solar um, because the the wind power particularly offshore now um, is, is driving this um, but if the frequency flips around too much, and I said plus and one minus 1% of 50, hega, 50 hertz, um, then you can get uh, power stations tripping off the grid. And this is what happened. Um, just check it. It's in August 19, 2019. Um, two power stations, so uh, an offshore wind fund, Hornsey One, and an RWE gas plant, um, dropped off the grid following a lightning strike. Um, and basically, you've got power outages all over the place. So it is very important to do this. Um, and because you, you can get these situations where you have to shut down a, a big power generator, you also need emergency supply to, to back up the, the power supply. Um, so these, these are the reasons that you need the, the power batteries on the grid. Um, but the main reason why this has been exploding recently is because batteries are getting cheaper and cheaper to produce. We're talking about lithium ion ones. There are various different technologies, but lithium ion is still the one that makes most sense. Um, this is from Bloomberg NEF, who are like sort of um, strategy consultants in this area. Um, and you can see that the, how far the um, price of um, battery storage has been falling. And they're predicting it will go from about $156 uh, a kilowatt hour now um, to about 100 by 2023. 
um, and still carry on from there. Um, this is uh, a chart from uh, Alexon, who um, are involved with the balancing the grid mechanism. And you can see here how the power prices vary through the day. Uh, the, the, chart, the, the text is a bit small, but basically it's price in megawatt hours. Um, so that we've got hours on the bottom, um, starting at uh, sort of midnight and running through. Um, and you can see by the time you get to hour 14, you're sort of about sort of two o'clock, um, power prices are almost zero. And that's because uh, the sun was shining then, the wind was blowing then, there wasn't a huge amount of demand. Um, and the gas plants that take a little while time to warm up and cool down again, were coming on stream in anticipation of the evening peak. So that the amount of power coming onto the network drives down the price. Um, so if you can store the price, store, store power when it's at this sort of time, and then sell it later on when there's um, higher demand and low generation, then you can make decent profits. <clears throat> so this is another way of, of making money from battery storage. So the three way, main ways of doing it is this intraday power price arbitrage, so to buying it low, selling it high, um, acting to um, make sure that the frequency doesn't change, which the national grid will pay you for, and in the capacity market, which is having emergency power generation that you can switch on at moment's notice. Um, <coughs> and the battery projects are ramping up. Um, so, I mean, the numbers are, I've, I've been trying to find a sort of reliable source from this, but about 900 megawatts of installed capacity is about right. And 13 and a half gigawatts of projects in the pipeline I've seen in some, some places, 10 and a half in others. Um, that relates to planning applications. Basically, everybody's kind of cotton on to what a good idea this is, and they're, they're all piling in. So um, one of the worries that I have with this is that eventually uh, some of the benefits of this will be crowded out. You can see, though, the amount of money that's available just um, for running the balancing mechanism um, is, is ramping up year by year. Um, and this, this is all driven by the flexibility that in generation that, that wind power is bringing in. Um, so there is a bigger pool of money to access and that will continue to grow. But still, I'm, I'm just questioning whether the returns are going to be great long term. But this is one of the big unknowns for the sector, I think. Um, and the other reason why um, you can't be absolutely sure that this is going to be a great investment for 20, 30 years is because of the huge amount of battery capacity that's going to come on stream uh, in relation to electric vehicles. Um, so the picture there is Tesla's Gigafactory in Nevada, uh, and that's a Tesla battery. Um, one theory is that when we're all driving electric vehicles, you'd be able to use the, um, the cars uh, as the car batteries as actually off-grid storage. So um, kind of negating the need for, for all of this investment. So at the moment, these are great investments. They're great yields. Um, and definitely worth investigating. Longer term, I think the picture's a bit cloudier, and that's something I think maybe we need to think about uh, again in the future. Tritax, I wanted to mention quickly, uh, just because it, it has been on a big discount. The discount is narrowing. Uh, you can still see cheaper than the competitors here, which are Urban Logistics and Warehouse Reads. So 1.6 discount there on both on premiums. Um, the re one of the reasons I think it's got cheaper is because its returns haven't been that great recently. I mean, they've been good, positive at least, but, but not great. Um, and you see that they're lagging those two there. Um, and part of that seemed to be because it just invested so much money so quickly. Um, and then it, it decided to uh, invest a lot of money in land in Dartford um, and develop more projects on spec. Um, and there's the, the side that they bought, which is the, an old power station, which is really quite chunky in terms of size, but quite well connected to everything as well. Um, so they've been gradually um, building out projects on here. Uh, you can see some of the ones that are in situ. Um, but 
So I slightly put this in the wrong order. But they've, they've, today they've announced they're going to build one, or so yesterday, sorry, earlier in the week, sorry, they, they've announced one they're going to build for another one for Amazon it, on, on that site. Um, so it, they're, they're really chunky things, these things. They're, so it's 200 million cost to develop it. Um, but then it's um, 2.3 million square feet of warehouse space, um, which um, takes the exposure to Amazon for that whole portfolio up to 7 million square feet, about 19% of the fund. I mean, th this is really where the growth, and we talked about this before, but the real big growth in the property sector at the moment is in this kind of warehousing. It's in the fulfillment centers for online shopping. Um, and Tritex are in the right place at the right time. And as they build out more and more of this um, Dartford land, it becomes less a sort of drag and returns and, and actually provides decent uh, future for the company. So I do think actually Tritex is looking uh, reasonably good at the moment. Um, briefly on Cavelli Value Plus, um, this discount is narrowed in 4.5%, um, but within the uh, North American sector, it's been a real laggard. It's, it's, performance has been really quite dreadful. Um, and the reason for that mainly is its kind of value style, uh, which we know has been out of favour for a while uh, and all over the place. Um, and that's dragging on returns. Some of the shareholders have got fed up. The reason why this is interesting is because the board has come out and said there's a vote uh, on the 30th of July um, for uh, whether the fund should continue or not. And the board has said, vote against continuation. Um, and Investec Wealth, who are one of the big investors across the whole sector, and only 18% of this fund have said they're going to vote against. Um, one of the discount players based in the States, 1607, we probably assume that they're going to vote against. But there's this uh, group here, Associated Capital Group, with 27.8% um, stake um, last time it was announced, who is controlled by the manager. So it could be that this block of shares is um, voted for the fund to continue to try and, and block the um, demise of this fund. If that happens, I think there'll be an almighty row. And um, so it's, I just sort of marking your card as this might be something to, to watch. If you're invested in it, I suppose you're going to be quite excited about it. Otherwise, I suppose it's just for the um, entertainment value. Um, again, quick mention on Linsel Train. Um, I keep banging on in articles and everything we write on this. Um, the premium has been ridiculous. Um, and if you buy something on a big premium, you can never guarantee that that won't narrow again and when it does your performance is going to look pretty dreadful and you can see what the extreme it got to last year um, and then you can also see what happened in the uh, crash of um, February March and actually went to a discount um, for the first time in a very long time um, there's the um, premium chart by itself really at about a 10% premium which is where it is now that's about the right price um, and if you're paying a lot more than that, I, I think you're daft. What I can't understand, and it, I am, it's a very noble thing to do, but the managers said they're not going to take their performance fee because um, investors have, have lost money in share price terms, despite the fact they actually made decent money in, in any of the terms. Um, I think they should have really stuck two fingers up and taken it because um, they've warned shareholder investors, the board has... We have, all sorts of other commentators have, if people carry on buying stuff when, when we, everybody else is saying staff price, I think it's a case of caveat emptor, but there we go. Um, and then last but not least, Jupiter, well, what was Jupiter European? <laughs> it's now European opportunities, so I must try and remember that. Um, I'm slightly miffed for this because I'm an investor in this one and um, the manager, Alexander Dyerwall, has been in love with this thing, Wirecard, for a very long time. And you can see here at the bottom, at the end of May, actually, it was 14% of the portfolio. And it even got um, more than that. I thought that was excessive. Um, and I actually wrote an article around um, slightly earlier than that, I think, basically saying I'm selling some shares because I think this is too risky. Um, and then 
everything started to kick off with uh, the FT investigation into Wirecard's finances. Um, and of course, that all came home to re uh, roost yesterday. So at the end of May, Wirecard was 10.3% of the European Opportunities Portfolio. Um, and here's the Wirecard share price. And you can see what happened yesterday. Uh, dropped from over 100 down to um, 23. Um, so that's taken a huge chunk off uh, European Opportunities NAV. Um, I don't know whether that will change the way that Alexander runs the money. <coughs> I doubt it because you can see that he likes having chunky high conviction positions. Um, but more than 10%, I think, is just daft. And having so many of these things, um, I think, is probably wrong too. So it's been interesting to see what the board say. Um, but the odds stock that's up towards 10%, fair enough. Um, but to have so many that large, I think, is just maybe dangerous. There we go. Um, that's probably enough from me. Um, why don't we now... Um, open it up and invite uh, Pruxa to um, come on. There we go. Hello. Good morning. Well, not good morning for you, is it? Good morning, James. Hello. Hi. Um, so um, you are the co-manager of Asia Dragon, which is the, one of the, the, the uh, larger funds in the um, Asia Pacific sector. Um, I suppose just sort of by way of introduction, do you want to just sort of tell people um, a bit more about the fund, a bit about the, the um, history and what makes it different from some of its competitors? Yes, sure. Um, thank you very much for having me. And I would say one of the most different thing or the key the things that differentiate the fund would be in terms of our quality focus to investing. And I think um, that's pretty much very suited to the kind of uncertainty and volatility that we are seeing in the market right now because we believe that that allows us to, well, be different from the market um, and buy when the market are selling so that um, when we get into these quality stocks at a good price, that should reward um, the performance of the trust over the long term. So that's pretty much in terms of key differentiation. I think um, in terms of the intensity of research that we do, um, this trust itself is backed by um, the experience that we have in Asia. So that's been over 30 years of experience where we have um, offices on the ground, um, pretty much um, run by the locals as well. So we know the local markets, lo local conditions, and, and I think more importantly, the local context as well in which all these companies operate in. We are very bottom up, so we really drill down into the details, meet the management, and therefore from that, have the conviction to build up um, a portfolio that we believe are going to be long-term structural growth winners over the long run, and we stick to that. Um, we take this kind of market sell-off opportunities that we, have been, um, we all have been experiencing over the last few months and over the whole course of last year as well as buying opportunities um, for the quality portfolio that we like. So it's really sticking oh. to the little. So what, what makes a quality company in your eyes? What, what, what sort of things are you looking for? We look for a combination of things, but um, one of the most important thing that we look at would be in terms of corporate governance, um, ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. And, and that's really important because we believe that that drives the long-term sustainability of the business that we invest in. And it doesn't um, come at a cost that will bite you back into the future. As part of that, um, extremely important is the strength of the balance sheet um, and the cash flow of the business, which you can imagine that um, in this time of volatility where you are a bit more concerned about the survivorship of companies, having a company that has a strong balance sheet that will be able to buy up other competitors and consolidate the market um, would be a good trade to have. So those are some of the things that we look for. Um, but of course, the more important thing would be it has to have a good business model as well and one that we think has a strong competitive advantage um, that allow them to grow the business again in a sustainable manner over the long run. Cool, okay. And then what has happened to you with, with COVID-19? Um, obviously, 
China was affected first, and um, you had a little bit of um, falls in that market before anything really took hold here. So, did you do anything with the the portfolio over that period, or? Um, Yes, we have actually done quite a fair bit and, and I think it goes back to how we are taking the advantage of the sell-off in the market, particularly during March, um, to be adding to some of the quality stocks that we like. Um, the things that we have identified through our research in the past, but they were too, deemed too expensive and we have held off. Um, the March sell-off has allowed us to do that. And some of this um, happens to be in China as well. And a lot of this happens to be in domestic China. Um, like what you've mentioned, China is sort of first in and first getting out of the whole COVID-19 situation and um, domestic China, we still think is a structural area to be. So one of the few things that um, we have bought into during the sell-off would be to introduce uh, a few new companies. Mm -hmm. They tend to be in the space of what you call digitalization and what that means is that um, it, uh, it enhances connectivity and you can imagine that uh, if we are sitting here today given uh, the environment that we are in um, I think digitalization has accept it has actually accelerated during this whole period because of COVID-19 so some of those businesses um, are doing really well in China and have taken um, this advantage of the situation to actually accelerate their growth um, and coming out of it in a stronger position um, one example would be a company called Tencent um, Tencent is the biggest holding that we have within the trust our top position. And Tencent has, I think, you, I think beneficiary might be the wrong word, but they would have held up relatively well and have uh, made the best of the situation. Um, while the core business is in games, um, as people spend more time indoor, um, the need for indoor entertainment games have actually gone up. Tencent is... Um, China's leader in that and they have benefited from that. The other area might be in where you think about all the offline businesses, the small stores that are struggling because of the COVID-19 where restaurants need to be closed. They need to find ways to, to survive and getting online is their way to survival and that is also being linked by Tencent WeChat system. So those are some of the things that we have um, added on and invested in during this period. Oh, okay. I mean, how are things sort of back to normal there? I mean, it's difficult for us to tell, I suppose, without being able to travel now. But um, has economic activity kind of returned to normal everywhere across Asia, or, or is it still quite muted? It's quite different across Asia. So I would say um, within Asia itself, North Asia is near is the nearest to normal and within that um, Korea, China and Taiwan are almost back to normal. Um, you see that for uh, some very interesting things that we are seeing right now for example from one of our beer companies in China they are telling us uh, about a week or so back that 90 to 95 percent of the restaurants that they sell beers to are now open. Um, the nightlife channel is more than 70 percent open um, and that's pretty much, uh, I think, some signs of normalcy in China. But of course, that you are hearing um, news of the second wave coming on in Beijing as well. So that's always going to be a risk as the economy starts to open up. When you come more towards uh, Singapore, um, which is where I'm based right now, um, today is the start of phase two. Um, and it's the day that we are able to go out um, and able to gather in uh, smaller social circles with five people. Um, and you are able to, I think, um, dine in as well. Um, so that's Singapore. Um, otherwise, if you move on to, say, um, India and Indonesia, where it's more developing Asia, I think the situation there is still pretty much in a phase lockdown situation. Mm. Um, and I think the, the biggest challenge there that we need to observe for the next few quarters, actually, is how they are going to um, start easing the lockdown and how that will impact the economy because obviously um, keeping an extended lockdown in such economies is very costly. Um, the economy can't afford it but given the vast population as well, um, managing that phase, um, easing of the lockdown is going to be a bit challenging. Um, so that's where we are in Asia. Um, I think 
closer to normal than a few months ago, but not really there yet. And then some of the stock market, so the, the Chinese market, it's really not much, hasn't, it's probably up, hasn't it, over, over the year. Um, so, I, and there's, there's been talk that an awful lot, I mean, there's been an awful lot of stimulus going in from the government. Um, do, you, do you think the market's fairly valued now, or do you think it's, it's actually looking a bit strained? If you look at the Chinese market, actually, um, they have, when, when we look at the way that the Chinese market has moved, it has actually been a lot more resilient than the rest of Asia. And particularly within China, China A has also been, um, which is the domestic onshore market, has been more resilient than China as a whole as well. And I think um, the, the reason behind that, if you want to put some explanation to that, is really China from a impact of COVID-19 perspective, has uh, has um, a bit more certainty because they are the first in and they are the first out and they are starting to return to normal. From So from that perspective, um, China, I think, um, has been quite ahead in terms of containing the virus and trying to bring things back to the normal in terms of economy. If you look at the policy response from China, actually, I would say that they have been actually very disciplined. Um, the numbers that have come out in terms of stimulus from China are not anywhere near developed markets. And even within Asia, they are not anywhere near developed Asia as well. So China as a whole have been a lot more targeted and measured with regard to their policy responses and they tend to target more in terms of subsidies, tax incentives, and really trying to help um, the small medium enterprises, which are the ones that um, are struggling during this period. So I would say that um, the measures have been pretty disciplined and it's actually quite good to see because if we recall um, many years back, um, China went on a spending spree in terms of stimulus and the ramifications of that have um, resulted in a very high leverage which China took the last two years to start unwinding them. So I think this time round they are a lot more disciplined and we like to see that. So I would say um, from a China market perspective, um, it doesn't look too overvalued. Um, there are explanations to why the market is a bit more um, supportive. Oh, okay, cool. All right, um, let's um, open up to questions. So if you've got any questions, put them in the Q&A um, or just email me. Um, well, um, we let people do that. I did have one question actually about the battery thing. Um, so. Um, John's asking, uh, as battery prices are likely to reduce and people can buy data percent cheaper in the future, why is now a good time to invest in this space? And I, I think that's the, um, that's the crucial bit here, really, that, um, that as battery prices continue to fall, it, it makes these projects, uh, each, every new project becomes, um, well, it's cheaper to install them, obviously. Um, you still need to secure things like planning permission and get the land and all that sort of stuff. So it's not just about the batteries, but um, it makes sense to me, I think it's what you're getting at, that the returns start to fall too. Uh, and this is, I suppose, my sort of niggling worry with the back of these things. So um, I think these things are probably going to look like very good investments for the next um, four or five years, but as we get beyond that, I think it's going to get harder to tell whether they're, they're, um, the advantage they've got now is going to be eroded away. As you get more competition in, more money going in, I do worry that the returns will be eroded away. So there we go. That's why so I have a sort of slight nicotine question over that relative to um, the renewable energy sector, as the rest of the renewable energy sector, um, where government subsidies are going to come on to play. Having said that, because it's so necessary to get this stuff in, um, I wonder whether something will happen in the way that these things are, are priced so that um, the grid actually gives you longer term contracts for providing this stuff, um, and that might under, underpin the revenues. Well, we'll see, anyway. Um, do you know the company? Uh, Uh, one question for Bruxa. Um One of the things that, that um, your um, 
investor fund Pacific Horizon is, is invested in is a gaming stock called SEA, uh, and that's been driving their returns. And um, is that stock that you looked at? No, we actually um, are not invested in that stock. Um, the way that we play gaming exposure, um, I've mentioned, is through Tencent. And, and I think the beauty of Tencent in terms of its gaming exposure is that it is um, more of a platform. Um, and that's really important, really, because what that means is that you are a distributor in terms of um, the gaming, and you don't actually bear um, a single game's risk from that perspective. So Tencent has, the, has made use of the strength in distribution um, with games. Uh, so they are the biggest one that is the publisher in China. So if you want to publish any games in China, you have to go through Tencent. Tencent makes a cut of that. So that's a very powerful machine. Um, going forward, what they have been doing over the last few years is they have moved upstream to invest in content as well. So that means that they have been investing in um, world-class gaming studios um, and have a very strong pipeline of games that are um, that they are again the gateway to China to launch them in China and getting that game development margins as well but you don't have a single games risk because Tencent has a pipeline and Tencent um, also has a distribution channel and they are trying to use this model to move from China um, to become um, a more of a global player so from this perspective we do think that um, the business model of Tencent is uh, less volatile and is more sustainable for growth over the long run. And, and that's why this has been our peak uh, from the gaming side. Uh, and of course, Tencent is not just about gaming, but the cash flow of Tencent um, over the last few years um, has been funded by gaming. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, I had a question about the, your allocation to Vietnam. Um, so I've, I've got a fact sheet here in front of me. So I think it was 1.7% of the portfolio at the end of May. And uh, the question is, why not more? Um, given, I think we, because we've been talking about Vietnam recently, about uh, what a sort of great place it is to invest. Um, any views on, on that? Yes. Um, so we have actually been seeing uh, a growing opportunities in Vietnam. And, and you're right, I think, what we have been doing to this, during this period, um, Apart from adding to China, we have also been adding to Vietnam. And Vietnam is, from a market perspective, is still pretty much um, a less mature market. So in certain stocks, when you want to get in, uh, liquidity is low. And there is a foreign ownership premium as well, which you would have uh, to pay to get in. So we take that into consideration when we think about valuation. But I think that also lends itself to the close-ended fund structure that we are in that it allows us to be able to invest in um, a market that is of a lower liquidity and hold for the long term. So yes, Vietnam is interesting and we have been adding to the, um, to the market, particularly if you think about um, one of the big things that happened, that has already started, but I think has accelerated during this period is the move from globalization to regionalization. Mm -hmm. And essentially um, supply chains are starting to move out of China um, from trade war situation last year, but COVID-19 this year has just reminded everyone that they got to speed this up. Um, Vietnam is one of those that are welcoming um, some of this move with open arms, with established um, industrial parks for the Japanese, for the Koreans, the electronics sector. And, and I think um, that's where uh, the attraction is. And you also have very young demographics um, that is supportive for growth over the long run. So yes, we do like Vietnam, but we are also mindful of, of the valuation um, and the maturity of the market. Cool, okay. Um, I have a question about, uh, just, just asking what the active share is. For anybody listening who wonders what that is, the basically it's just saying how different are you from the, the index. Um, but I'm gonna link it to uh, the thing I was talking about before with European opportunities. So, Tencent, I think is 9.6% of the portfolio. So that's really quite a chunky position. Um, well, how do you sort of determine how big the weightings are and, and what do you think is, is too big? Um, but also if you ask the active share question as well, please. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to pull up active share um, as I answer your question because my computer is a bit slow. Um, <laughs> even all, all the data traffic that we have been coming through. Um, but essentially, 
with regard to positioning of the fund and how much we would have in a particular stock is really de determined by the conviction level uh, mm -hmm. that we have within that, that stock. And the way that we think about that, um, we go back to my earlier point about how we really have done our homework uh, very extensively over a few years before we actually build up uh, conviction in the stock and then we go it for the long term. So actually, if you were to move back 18 months ago, um, Tencent position is not 9.6%. Uh, uh, Tencent position was less than half of that. And gradually, as we start to see um, the valuation becomes a lot more attractive, and we start to see some of the execution coming through according to our investment thesis, we continue to gain conviction, and that has allowed us to allocate more to Tencent. Um, so yes, we do uh, take conviction behind our stocks, but we also have a sense check where we have a risk management system um, internally called the ERT, which stands for Equity Risk 2, that allow us to basically be aware of the intended risk um, that we want to take for the portfolio from a portfolio perspective. And that means that whether you think about factor risk from a country perspective or a sectoral perspective, um, we don't want to be taking unintended risks that you are not aware of at the portfolio. Every risk that we take, whether it's a stock level, a sector level, or a portfolio level, is intended and it has to back by our research at level of conviction. Sure. So that's uh, pretty much the way that uh, we think about it. And I suppose there are some big stocks in the index that, that you don't hold. I think like things like China Mobile and... Um, Yes, right. Um, we don't hold we don't hold China Mobile. Um, we used to hold China Mobile maybe two years back as well as at a smaller position, and um, we saw out of it really because opportunities elsewhere. Um, and and even though China Mobile was uh, valued at an attractive valuation, high dividend yield as well, um, we thought from a capital allocation perspective is better to allocate to other names so we have used that as a funding source so the active share, one, active, Alibaba, isn't it? Um, active share is 73 percent for the okay, portfolio cool. yeah so that's 73 percent of the of the portfolio is not represented by the positions in the index that's that's how you define it so um i should say alibaba is the other big one that, that you don't have a big position in Yes, that's right. Uh, we currently don't own um, Alibaba in the portfolio. And, and again, um, there are a few things that we, we have in mind in terms of milestones that we would like to observe uh, for Alibaba. Um, and we have done um, a lot of work behind it as well uh, over the last few years, uh, but we don't own it at the moment. I mean, it's the same way that we have been uh, doing a lot of work on, on things that could become uh, interesting ideas but there are a few things that we would like to see changing um, before we add it to the portfolio. Okay, cool. Um, I had a question about um, Chinese and domestic investors and how much that drives the local market. Can you, um, I suppose that that's something you just have to factor into to, to what you're doing, especially in China A shares. Yes, that's right. But we actually see them as, um, as an opportunity. So um, to answer that question, China domestic investors uh, and mainly retail Chinese domestic investors are the drivers of the market and they form, um, I think, more than 70% of the market in terms of trading activities. So they are very active. And, and I think the history of this goes back to how uh, China domestic market was once close off to investors, uh, foreign investors, until very recently, and, and that means about five to six years ago. So we have actually been um, looking into this market and have started our work into this market uh, way back. And in fact, we have a dedicated China A fund as well. And from there, we use that to understand uh, the, the local market and identify the stocks that we like within that domestic industry. So yes, it's going to be a volatile market, but I think it's one that has been proven um, that uh, active is the way to go in this market. And actually, if you pick the right stocks, um, you can actually do very well in this market as well. 
So I talk about how we have been um, adding more to domestic China, um, and that means some of the Asia names um, that Dragon holds, um, it will be names like Mao Tai, which is the high-end premium uh, white liquor um, that you can drink in China, and now it's now going a bit more international. That is doing very well for us. Right. Um, the other name that we have within the portfolio is uh, China Tourism, and essentially they are a duty-free play. And if you go... Uh, Duty free shopping in Seoul, for example, um, you will see a lot of Chinese shoppers there. So actually, it's the Chinese that have been spending the duty free um, spending overseas, and the Chinese government is um, over the long run trying to bring them back. And this is the way that the overall policy and the industry is opening. Um, the market is volatile because of retail investors, but when that happens, then we see it as a buying opportunity. Cool. Okay. Um, there's a question about Tencent and expanding overseas and privacy and things, but I think well, this is all wrapped up with the general, um, I suppose it's the Huawei thing, that about um, is the expansion of Chinese firms into Western markets going to be curtailed by this, this whole um, privacy row, um, the sort of war between the US and China? Is, is that something you worry about? Mm -hmm. I think it is quite true that um, overseas acquisitions by Chinese companies, um, particularly in the US, um, is going to be a lot more difficult than before, um, especially if they are in, sense in, in industries that you are deemed to be sensitive. And that means uh, technology industries, uh, industries with uh, IP-related areas, um, that is going to be a lot more difficult um, from that perspective. So we are not too worried about that um, because number one, um, I think China is actually a very big growing market and you are actually seeing a lot of US companies or Western companies trying to grow into China. So actually just by focusing on um, Chinese market, that is a very big and growing domestic market for them itself. And number two, I think if you look at the way that Chinese companies have grown over the years, in terms of competency, I would say in certain areas, they are not really that behind the Western companies. So they actually don't have to acquire them um, in these areas to be able to grow like in the past. Um, and most of the time, if you look at it, um, they tend to overpay for the acquisition. Um, that results in a very high goodwill as well. And sometimes that did not turn out too well. So actually, um, it may not be that bad um, that they can't acquire too much overseas. But I think more importantly, because I think the competency of Chinese companies have actually grown um, over the years. Mm. I mean, I suppose this kind of brings us back to the question I had, the last question I had on the um, screen, which is, um, I mean, domestic, in, within Asia, within the region, I mean, the COVID things we've talked about seems to be better under control. Everything seems to be uh, reopening again. Economy's picking up. Uh, they've got lots of strong companies that are developing their own technology and, and growing. Um, does it really matter so much now? If, if um, because in the old days, if we had a sort of recession in the US, it would have been disaster for Asia. Is is that less of an issue now? Relatively less of an issue to, to a certain extent, but I think we all have to remember that Asia as a block, um, it is still an exporting block um, where, where basically uh, Asia as a whole is still an exporting market to developed markets um, in Western economies, whether you think about Europe or the US. So from, from that perspective, um, any tension um, is going to be uh, impacting I think the sentiment side as well of the markets so yes from a sentiment perspective it's going to be an issue but if you but I think it's, it's quite easy to generalize that um, it's going to be you know affected but again if you look at how the Chinese economies um, have shifted themselves over the years as well they have actually been reducing their reliance on export um, growing the domestic pocket and growing consumption. So from that point of view, the impact is going to be less, but no doubt it will still be impacted. And China as a trading partner of Asia has also become in, um, increasingly more important where if you look at um, 
China intra-Asia trade within China that has also grown to a substantial size um, um, versus the US and Europe, but it's not going to be where the case where it's overwhelming that um, any weakness in terms of tensions from US and Europe will not have an impact on the uh, export sectors. It's just going to be less. Okay, cool. Um, and then, I don't know if you want to get into the whole politics thing, but, um, but do you actually think Singapore might benefit uh, from what's going on in Hong Kong? I suppose actually maybe that's true already. <laughs> I think um, what you are seeing right now in Singapore, um, there's, there's a few things that the Singapore government has been positioning themselves for. Um, over the last few years, they have actually tried to develop a wealth management business in Singapore where they are attracting all the private banks um, and uh, you can simply simply understand this as the Switzerland of Asia where Singapore try to be a bit more neutral in terms of their political stance and they try to keep, uh, I think, a stable regulatory framework as well as political situation to basically try to attract um, the private money coming into Singapore. So we have seen the success of that and I would say, given the current situation, I think you wouldn't be surprised that uh, flows of money keep on coming in. Uh, some of them have historically come from Indonesia, Russia, and emerging um, wealth within Asia. But increasingly, we are seeing that coming in from uh, China and Hong Kong as well. Um, so yes, Singapore is going to be some beneficiary from that. But I think we all should also not forget that Singapore uh, is also an open economy. Yes. So from uh, volatility, if, if the overall region within Asia has volatility, uh, Singapore will not be immune um, from that perspective. But um, I think what Singapore does offer is the political stability um, as well as regulation, regulatory environment stability, which I think is good to attract businesses um, and attract um, in terms of uh, the money within the management side over the long run. Cool. Okay. Um, one last question. Maybe sort of covered this at the beginning, but but um, can you also explain how the um, the team works? Because uh, the quite one of the questions is: Does is Hugh Young involved in the management of this? Um, so if, who have you actually got in the in the team there? And how many people? And, and how how does it all break down? Mm -hmm. So um, as you would know, Hugh is the one that's basically pioneered the business um, more than thirty years ago in Asia. And Hugh basically um, is the one that I think uh, started the investment process. And the investment process, of course, has been evolving as the firm grows, but as also um, we have learned lessons from the past in terms of how we have uh, made mistakes, but also have made the right decisions over the last 30 years to refine the investment process. Yeah. Um, the core of the investment process remains the same in that we are very focused on bottom up. Um, that and we believe in meeting with management, doing our own homework and coming out with conviction. Um, that has been there since day one and that has not changed. Um, but one of the key things, or uh, can call it one of the key refinements that we have been doing over the last uh, three or four years is really to also um, give ourselves a bit more focus on the sectors. So that allows you to uh, dive deeper and more uh, of a interconnected uh, pockets that we have across Asia because nowadays what you are seeing is that um, there's a lot of disruptions going on um, and in fact the lessons that you learn from a particular country in a particular sector can be applied across Asia. So apart from going deep, having our uh, local people on the ground, um, having the breath through sectoral knowledge and linking that knowledge across Asia is also very important. Um, so we have more than 45 fund managers um, who double head as fund managers as well as analysts across the region um, with local footprint. And I would say the combined experience of, um, of this in on having a strong belief in our investment process um, is also the I think um, you, you actually need to spend some time meeting your companies um, to have that level of conviction and you have to observe them over a long time as well because good behaviors don't come in good times. 
uh, uh, sorry, bad behaviors don't come in good times. Bad behaviors tend to come in um, bad times, and that's when you start to see whether the companies are li living to their true strategy of what they are telling us in terms of their behaviors. Cool. Okay, thank you very much for that. So um, we'll probably wrap it up there. Um, thank you very much for um, your uh, comments, Brooke. So it's been really helpful. Um, and thank you for everybody else that, that attended. Um, we have to give us a little compliance. Obviously, uh, just that you buy or sell anything that I've talked about. Um, and we should always mention that um, prices of these things go up and down and um, we, um, you know, you can lose money and some of these things are, are geared and that can mean that you can lose even more money, um, maybe in the whole investment, but that's very, very rare. Um, so those, that's the sort of basic compliance thing. Um, we'll be back next week. Um, look forward to seeing you then. Um, and yeah, with that, I shall um, sign off. Thank you very much.